Okay, welcome to the real-time DSP lab course. This is, uh, we've already done four lectures now, and we're up to going over the first homework solution set that was turned in. So this is homework zero, which is counted for grade. Now, I would call it homework zero because it's really meant to review concepts from your signals and systems course, reacquaint you with MATLAB, or acquaint you with MATLAB, as the case may be, and give you some connections between some mathematical uh, formulas and how you simulate those in MATLAB. Lab. It's also a good chance to review sampling and transforms, kind of the heart of signals and systems course. So I'm going to go over the solution set. It's eight pages, and again, the hard copies are coming. Uh, but any so fire away the questions as we go through the homework set. Again, four questions on this homework set, and the solutions will be posted online as well. So the first question had to do with a practical aspect of observing a signal for a finite period of time. We can't wait for the end of time, and we can't go back to the beginning of time to observe a signal, so we're stuck with, which really isn't so bad, actually. So we're, we have in our, there we go. So we have an observation. This is a cosine that we're going to observe for uh, one second. So instead of working with a two-sided cosine, which is more common, in the signals and systems class, we're going to say what happens when we, can, when we can only observe it for a short period of time. In this case, we're going to observe it for one second. So this cosine so it starts at zero as a certain number of oscillations and ends at one second. Okay, so that's our observation. We want to know what happens to the Fourier content of this compared to the usual two-sided case. So we're going to compare the two. It also is going to give us insight to what we'll see in a spectrum analyzer or in practice in lab. What kind of frequency content does this finite observation have? That's what we get to, to use in lab. Okay, so the first question is to plot this in the time domain. I gave you my hand sketch, so let's do it in MATLAB. So the first thing is to convert this to uh, MATLAB code. So a few things here in MATLAB, um, a few things that catch me off guard even today. They're, so first of all, MATLAB is really good at indexing arrays starting at 1. And so we want to start indexing things with negative entries. So first we have to set up a sampling time which is one over the sampling rate. So here I've chosen a high sampling rate of 100 hertz, right? So the sampling time is 0 .01, 0.01 seconds. I want to plot this from minus 5, 0.5 seconds to 0 0.5. It's 1.5 seconds, so that's minus uh, 0 0.5 to 1.5 and an increment of the sampling time. So I'll, my time step here is, you know, minus 0 0.5, minus, what, 0 0.499, minus 0.498, et cetera, until I get 1.5. So this generates a vector whose entries are these points in time that I want to use for sampling. The frequency of the cosine, the code is updated, but here's the frequency of the cosine, which is at 10 hertz. And then to generate the product, I need to multiply the cosine with this rectangular pulse. The rectangular pulse in MATLAB is, uh, is uh, non-causal. It goes from minus one half to one half. So in order to make this causal, we simply delay it by half a second so that this delayed rectangular pulse is one. So this is rec pulse. T minus 0.5 in, in MATLAB. Amplitude is one. So that enforces the finite observation. And then we plot it in the time domain. So we get 10 oscillations over the second. Uh, hand sketch of the Fourier transform. So the next thing is to find the Fourier transform. 
Sorry, I didn't ask you. Jack, how do I advance a page? You should be able to just use the keyboard. Yes, and you're correct. Thank you. All right. So we take the Fourier transform. It's a product in the time domain, so we can evolve in the Fourier domain. So in, the, in this case, we have a product of two time signals convolved in the Fourier domain. So the Fourier transform of the two-sided cosine is convolved with the Fourier transform of this delayed rectangular pulse. The Fourier transform of the cosine, here I'm doing this in radians per second, is a pair of direct deltas. And that pair of direct deltas, I have one centered at uh, minus omega naught and one centered at uh, omega naught. Okay, so 2 pi times f naught in radians per second. And then the rectangular pulse, the anti-causal version, becomes a sink, and we get a phase change because of the delay by one half. So this is a pretty nice property. We use it quite a bit. So a change in the a delay in the time domain corresponds to a phase shift in the frequency domain. So I'm multiplying by a phase. This phase term has what magnitude? One. So the magnitude is one. It's just shifting the phase. It's the only effect it has. It doesn't affect the magnitude. This will become important later in the class. Okay. And then, our, then the familiar sink um, shape for the Fourier transform of the non-causal rectangular pulse. And just to point out, different books have different definitions of the sink, S-I-N-C, function. So you, when you use a lookup table, it's important to know which version they're using. Either version is good. This one uh, uses um, sine, sink of x is sine pi x divided by the quantity pi x. Another version uh, that's out there is simply the sine of the argument divided by the argument. Right, so it's an alternate version. You can kind of eyeball which version they mean based on the content. That's interesting. <laughs> based on the content um, of the argument. So the arguments, units have to be what? Radiance. Radiance. Okay. So you can tell from the argument. All right. So that's. So it depends on what x is. But if x is not in radians, then you're going to need. It'll probably be this version that shows up underneath the table of formulas, or lies behind the table of formulas. OK, so then if we just do a convolution, what's really nice about the direct delta, it's, it's really the easiest signal to work with in terms of convolution. If I convolve with the direct delta, there's a really nice property. So if I shift the direct delta and I convolve with another signal, then what happens? It gives you the original signal shifted, so it simply gets f of t minus t naught. We can derive that from the sifting property of the direct delta. The sifting property of the direct delta says that if I integrate I mean, the limits of integration matter, so if I integrate over all time, then I get f of t naught. Okay, so this is this can be used for um, the uh, in the in their derivation of this applying the convolution formula. The sifting property will give you this relationship. So it's not something to necessarily memorize. You might internalize it with lots of use, but you can derive it using the convolution formula and the sifting property of the Dirac delta. Okay, so now I get uh, these two terms. I get. Both terms, so I get uh, I get this term shifted to the left by omega naught, and this term shifted to the right by omega naught. Standard sinusoidal amplitude modulation. Now I've asked you to plot the magnitude. Um, so this is kind of uh, messy. I've got phase terms in here. Uh, yes, omega is real valued, omega naught is real valued, but I've got basically an amplitude and phase form. So I've got complex valued function here to plot. So when you go about doing the magnitude response, it, you know, I gave you, I gave you a hint for this because it's a little bit tough to get it in, if you're in sketches by hand. Um, what, I sh what I gave you in the hints was if I take the absolute value, 
of this Fourier transform that I get this absolute value of a sum of two terms. And there's a very nice uh, bound that we can put here, at least gives us some ability to plot this by hand. So at least we can say that if A and B are complex valued, we can say that the absolute value of their sum is less than or equal to the sum of their absolute values. So it's just a nice way to, you know, it's not, again, this isn't a bound, but at least give you something that you can plot the bound of at least, which is at least something. So you know that the actual Fourier transform magnitude response will be at or below that bound. So at least you can do something to plot by hand. And you can go about plotting the sink by hand. If we do this in MATLAB, we can simply directly enter the Fourier transform formula as it is, as a complex value function of omega, where omega is radians per second, a real quantity, uh, and just go ahead and directly plot the absolute value um, of the Fourier transform. Go ahead. I have a question. In MATLAB, how come sometimes you use star for multiplication and dot star? Right. So that, that good. Thank you for asking that. So the, the cause that's what still, I still hit errors every now and then using MATLAB doing that. So if you're going to multiply two vectors together, there's some ambiguity. You either mean a dot product to get one number, or you mean I want to multiply each entry to get another vector just as long as the one I started. So, so here's option one. So I can say, okay, here's A1. So here's vector one. Star multiply means I get A1, B1, A2, B2. Had a rough day, I think, the market. Uh, so this is a pointwise multiplication. So that A1 is multiplied by B1 as the first element. A2 is multiplied by B2 as the second element. Okay, so in this context, when I was plotting in the time domain, I forgot to mention that subtlety, um, you really want to generate an amplitude for every time that you're sampling. And that amplitude is a product of the cosine and the rectangular pulse. So I'm starting with a vector in the time domain. And for every entry in that vector of my time samples, I want an amplitude value in the time domain. So it's this one that I need. The, the dot here means it's a point. So in words, this means point-wise multiplication, entry by entry multiplication, to get another vector of the same length. Dot product would mean, right, I would get A1 times B1 plus A2 times B2 and get a single number. Right? That's the alternative. And here you'll see that it shows up again. Right? Because here now I'm sampling in the frequency domain over some range in hertz. And I'm, and I'm using the, the, the formula for the Fourier transform directly. And that has uh, an exponential term sync, exponential term sync. So sync is built in the MATLAB. And the version built in the MATLAB, if you're never sure, there's a help function. But it's exactly the same version that we had uh, up above. So this is the version built in the MATLAB. Okay, so it's also important to know not only what the book is using that, you, that you're referring to, but also what is MATLAB using to match or not what your book is using. So you have to adjust accordingly. All right, so that is um, part B. So what we see here, this is the key is for all this work. The key is that what we're going to see is um, the frequency, the center of the frequency, so the cosine was at 8 hertz. So the cluster of energy is at 8 hertz and minus 8 hertz. So I think the MATLAB code earlier should be F0 is equal to 8, not 10. All right, so here is the, the, the clusters of energy are at 8 hertz and minus 8 hertz. And you'll notice this fall off away from the center frequency. How would you describe this uh, fall off? Steep. It's steep. Can you give me a quantitative answer? Exponential. Uh, you're close. One over, One over X. X. But what is X? Uh, yes. What domain are we in? Right. Yeah, we're in Hertz. So there's a fall off of 1 over F. Uh, 
and that corresponds to the denominator of the sink function. Right, so there's a there's oscillation. Because in the Fourier transform, the sink is sine over sine x over x or sine pi x over pi x. So I get the oscillations. Okay. And then the amplitude is scaled by by one over omega. And the shift here means that I'm centered at omega naught. And that shift is basic. So I, my 1 over f here is with respect to the, the center frequency. So that fall off is 1 over f. So if you go, again, if you were to analyze spectral content in the lab, you would get something that looks like this, plus there'd be noise. This is without any noise in it. So if you're looking at a output of a signal generator at 8 hertz, what you'll see is this kind of shape on the spectrum analyzer, simply because you're observing, you're observing this over a finite period of time. It has bandwidth, is another way to think about it. So as you observe it longer, does that drop off become steeper? That's correct. The drop off, uh, does it become steeper? If you do, uh, this, the drop-off doesn't change, but what does change is, see what changes here. So if the, uh, think what does change here? Um, well, so first of all, the bandwidth will will come down because the bandwidth is a is a is a product of your rectangular pulse. So if your rectangular pulse is wider, the bandwidth of that rectangular pulse is more narrow. Okay, so I'll get more narrow, and I'll get you know more more bounces in here. Um, it's still going to be it's still going to be related to a one over f fall off. That isn't going to change. Okay, but your bandwidth. So how do you measure bandwidth? Is another question that will come up here. So one way to measure bandwidth is from one zero crossing to another around the center frequency. This is called the null to null bandwidth. So this null to null bandwidth will decrease with increasing observation time. So what you're seeing here is basically um, the what's the width of the rectangular pulse that we're using here? How many seconds? One second. The inverse of that is one hertz. Okay, so it turns out that that is our that is the bandwidth on this side. The baseband bandwidth is one hertz after up conversion or sinusoidal modulation it's two hertz. That's where it comes from. Okay, so if I have a wider rectangular pulse, I'll have a more narrow, because the, the null to null bandwidth is one over the width of the rectangular pulse. Longer the rectangular pulse, the more narrow the bandwidth. So, I mean, this might be kind of a ridiculous question, but does that mean that the longer we, if we were listening to the sinusoid, the longer we listen to it, the less frequencies we hear? Okay, so your hearing is a little more complicated. Your hearing um, is is really a bank of bandpass filters, and you know this. That's a good question. So test it out for yourself, right? So there's a sound command in MATLAB. So there's. I don't know if I could discern that much of frequency. Yeah. Play. I'm, is, is, is it? I think it's sound or play. Now I can't remember which one it is. Um, it is, yeah. So it's just, it takes a vector of values um, and plays it back off your, through your sound card. So you can take this sequence that you've generated up in the time domain and just play it back. Okay, but now you have the sampling rate that you use now has to match, you have to sample it. Yeah. And that now has to match the sampling rate of your sound card. So you have to, f and there's some, if you do help on sound, it will tell you how to get that. Value so that your sound card has got a few, you know, usually a few settings. It just depends on what it's set at. Typically, it's 8,000 hertz, but it could be some other value. Is that for, I, I guess, for every type of signal, if you modulate it with a rectangular pulse, it'll increase the bandwidth? So if you multiply it by a rectangular pulse, um, does, it, let's see, does it always increase the bandwidth? Uh, my tendency is to say yes, but I just have a feeling there's always some counterexample out there. So we'll say generally. Okay. Uh, because what's going to happen, and the reason for that is why is that true? Because what will happen is the 
impact of multiplying by a rectangular pulse in the time domain, if we look at what happens in the Fourier domain, is now I convolve this, this sink, which is now two-sided, with whatever the Fourier transform is of the function I'm multiplying against. So the convolution generally spreads out. Right? If I convolve two signals, the result gets wider. Now, there are some counterexamples to that, by the way. Generally speaking, it's going to get wider. But this gives you some insight as to why when we, when we have finite observation time, we're going to get infinite bandwidth. In theory. in theory. And you see that in the plot, right? So the bandwidth, so the, if, you, if you think about what's the non-zero extent as your definition of bandwidth, it just never, I mean, it dies out as frequency goes to infinity, but not until you get to infinity. So you have to have some alternate definition of measure or an alternate way to measure bandwidth. So you could threshold this, right? Or you could do null to null bandwidth, or you could do power bandwidth. Lots of ways you can go about this. But in any measure you come up with, <coughs> this signal will have, this finite observation signal will have finite bandwidth, non-zero finite bandwidth, no matter how you choose to quantify it other than non-zero extent, right? some other way to quantify it. Okay, so let's compare this to the two-sided case. So the two-sided case, which is a familiar one, and in analysis, we often use the two-sided cosine for analysis just to see what happens. Now we go implement, well, we need a more realistic signal. Here's our two-sided cosine. The Fourier transform is a pair of direct deltas. The area under each direct delta is pi. And the direct deltas are located at the carrier frequency and negative of the carrier frequency. So that's the more familiar thing you're used to seeing but now if we, again, use finite observation time, the bandwidth is now not zero. So if I look at the bandwidth of this Fourier transform, the width of the direct delta is a bit strange. So you can either, just, so how would you describe the width of the direct delta? I'd say, like, for the, for the G-sided? Mm -hmm. This, this Fourier transform. I found that it's like a lot, it's, it's a lot less wide than the, than if you were to use rectangular okay. pulse, but you don't like zero, so what would you like? To, I I like zero, but I I, I can support other answers. One over, what are, infinity. one over infinity. That's a tough one to, you know. Okay. Uh, this is a two-sided cosine. We're not sampling. This is a two-sided cosine okay, in continuous so time. The Correct. Okay. Then yes. So, so in theory, it has zero width and zero bandwidth. It's a little frustrating, right? Because if we know there's content, and that content is piled at omega naught, and it has area pi. There's something there. This is why if you look at just amplitudes, it gets misleading. So there is, it is zero bandwidth, but at that zero bandwidth point, there's all this energy you know, piled into it. So it's a mathematical model. It's an abstraction of reality, not reality. Okay, so bandwidth is zero. So lots of ways you can go about um, computing the bandwidth of the two-sided sorry, of the finite observation cosine case, and I give you different ways to go about it. I like to hold an all bandwidth. It's easy to eyeball. There's no noise present, so it's easy to just eyeball the null to null bandwidth, and you get two hertz. And you can be more exotic and do other things. For the purposes of, like, the whole works like this, is eyeballing just easy? Eyeballing is a good answer. But you got to point out what you know what what points you're yeah, you know. what, what so is, what are you using as your basis? Right, just for so if you just put a number down and said I eyeballed it, I'm not <laughs> as convinced as you know you pl you look at a plot and you put down the points where you're you're pointing to where your eyeballs you know were measuring and why you have to defend your eyeballing to some degree instead of just coming up with an answer. But yes, it's a lot faster. Yeah. Okay, and it's also a sanity check on any additional numerical value you compute for bandwidth. And also, this is a case where the power bandwidth approach doesn't do very well. So I give you some code, MATLAB code for that. Okay, so that's problem uh, one. So I have to move a little faster here for the remaining three problems. All right, but any questions on one? Go ahead. Actually, we had a question about 
um, the first uh, part of the poem in which um, it, it was omega over two pi. We just looked at a Fourier transform table, and it was uh, it was just um, omega over two. See, it depends on your definition of sync. So the question is, is it omega over 2 or omega over 2 pi? Yeah. Depends how the sync is defined. Oh, OK. If it did not do that pi, then That's right. That's, why, that's where it comes from. That's right. All right, so let's do down conversion. So the first problem was sort of an up conversion question. And then I'm multiplying a signal, the rectangular pulse, by a cosine, and I get up conversion. Here's problem two. And we're do down conversion. All right, so we start with the bandpass transmission. And this is a Professor Cardwell problem, to give him full credit. He used to ask on his final exam in signals and systems. The other three questions are what I've asked on final exams in uh, signals and systems when I've taught it. These are Except the MATLAB part. The MATLAB part did not show. You didn't have to do MATLAB on the final exam. But the rest of it, yes. OK, so here's a bandpass transmission centered at 2 kilohertz. And I like in an amplitude of 2, I want to down convert this. So I'll multiply by cosine, where I assume exact knowledge of the center frequency. So omega naught is 2 pi times 2 kilohertz. And, as a re and then what I want to do after that is low-pass filter. So if I just look at what happens from input x to output y in the Fourier domain, then what I'm going to see is I'm going to see a cluster. So first of all, this the, the right or the positive frequency cluster is going to shift left by omega naught and shift right by omega naught, or if not, if you like, since we're in kilohertz. So that's 2 kilohertz. So one, this band will shift left and be centered at the zero frequency and shift right and be centered at 4 kilohertz. The left band is going to shift to the right by 2 kilohertz and to the left by 2 kilohertz. So I'll get two bands centered at 0. This band will be centered at 4 kilohertz. And this band will be centered at minus 4. And this is amplitude, what, what's the amplitude here? Two. two, and the amplitude here is one. Is one. I want to then, to finish the down conversion, I want to apply a low-pass filter to pass the baseband component and attenuate the components at higher frequencies centered at 4 and minus 4 kilohertz. So if you were to... If you were asked to give the bandwidth of that signal right there, what would it be? The, this one right here. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it's multiband. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the uh, if I had to answer it, I would say, well, I, two ways. Either I have a base band that's one kilohertz bandwidth plus a bandpass component, which is how wide two kilohertz wide, or I could think of this as a from a low pass point of view and say, well, my bandwidth is really this right edge which is 5 kilohertz. So it depends on your point of view. If I, you know, so I, if I had to pick one, I'd probably go with 5 kilohertz. But multi-band filters exist, and multi-band signals exist, right? So it's a little more complicated to describe, but you go either way with it. OK, so to work through this, so if we do the, so for part A, it says using Fourier transform properties derive an expression. So again, we're multiplying. Uh, we're taking x of t, which is a bandpass signal, multiplying it by a cosine. So it, what that means is that multiplying the time domain, so I, again, I can evolve in the, so multiplying the time domain, I can evolve in the Fourier domain. That means I take whatever the, the Fourier transform of x is and shift it left by omega naught and right by omega naught. And x in the Fourier domain, at capital X of omega, has these two concentrations of energy. And I've already said each one shifts left and right by 2 um, kilohertz. So we do that for a transform. And this is just what I showed earlier uh, in hand sketch. So we get uh, 
baseband component plus a bandpass component, and we low pass filter. Low pass filter's job is to attenuate the high frequency components and pass the baseband component. I have a region in between. So what do I do with this? We call this the transition band. This is the band of frequencies between what I want to pass, which is up to one kilohertz, what I want to attenuate, which is a three kilohertz and above, and what's in between, there's some flexibility what I do. And we'll see a little bit later that, you know, in, again, in practice, we're going to have noise in here, and this is also a two-sided case in this problem, so in reality, it's going to be a finite observation. So in reality, there will, there will be frequency content between one and three kilohertz, noise and artifacts from finite observation. So the low-pass filter probably won't have the luxury of having a very relaxed roll-off between pass band and stop band. So what happens in here, uh, we may have a little bit more narrow uh, transition band. A typical transition, transition band is 10% of bandwidth. Is a more typical, and we'll see this in homework sets two and three a little bit later, doing filter design. This is more or less 10% of bandwidth. So if the bandwidth here is one kilohertz, the transition band is about 10% of that, or 0.1 kilohertz, or 0.1 kilohertz. And then we are already at the stop band. Okay. So the theory is we pass the base band exactly, we reject exactly or completely the high frequency components. In practice, these will leak through. We can't eliminate them exactly. For the purpose of this problem, we assume that we can exactly eliminate the uh, high frequency components. So that's down conversion. Go ahead. So when we're talking about uh, filtering, uh, does it make sense to always talk about negative frequencies? If it's a real valued, uh, it's a filter with real valued coefficients, which is what we'll deal with except one time after spring break. Uh, it's very, that it's enough just to talk about what happens in positive frequencies because the magnitude response is even symmetric and the phase response is odd symmetric. So if I know what happens in positive frequencies, I know what happens in negative frequencies. I don't have to design for those. They'll just be there. All right. Okay, so that's problem two. Problem three, sampling, shows up a lot. It's already, you know, in the first problem. Trying to plot something in MATLAB. So we can think of sampling as multiplying, if I want to sample a little f of t, I can think of this, again, this is theoretical and ideal, by multiplying f of t by this impulse train. This impulse train represents these instantaneous snapshots that I'm going to take every sampling period. That's mathematical idealism. In practice, we can't take instantaneous anything. There's going to be some observation time. All right, but for this is the theory part here. So P of T is this impulse train. So what does it look like in the time domain? It's just a bunch of impulses. And the area is 1 in this case. So I have an impulse, area 1, impulse, area 1. And the impulses are uh, uniformly spaced. So here's T sub S, 2T sub S. And this goes in both directions. And just if you want to draw this by hand, it's you know, on a test in particular, homework as well. And it continues. Let us know. And so the three dots helps us see that. Okay, so I have impulses in both directions. Both directions. Okay. Now, I gave you the Fourier series expansion of this, which you can get from books. So the Fourier series expansion says, if I have a periodic signal, I can decompose it into an infinite sum of cosines and sines. In this particular case, because the impulse train is even symmetric in the time domain, the, co the sine terms go to zero, and I'm left with only my cosine terms, the cosine being even symmetric, and the sine is odd symmetric. 
So the sine terms drop out. I'm left with this um, Fourier series of the, and it's exact because we allow the frequency content to go out to infinity. So I have a cosine, I have a DC term of one, cosine at the sampling rate, cosine at two times the sampling rate. So I actually plot the impulse train, which is what I had on the, you know, by hand earlier, and here's a more uh, carefully drawn version. Uh, next one was, next part here was, what is the period? Um, so the period here is simply going to be the sampling time, P sub, capital T sub S. Now it's true that any multiple that's also a period, so the fundamental period, if you want to be pre you know, precise, would be capital T sub S. If I looked at what happened, so if I were to shift this signal, delay it by capital T sub S, there'd be no change in the signal. If I delayed it by two times the capital T sub S, there also would be no change in the signal. So any multiple of capital T sub, any integer multiple of capital T sub S would be a period. Okay, part C was, you know, given this Fourier series representation, can you get um, the Fourier transform from that, or the Fourier series, I'm still in the time domain. So if I can apply the Fourier transform to that to get now, for every cosine, I get two direct deltas, one at the frequency of the cosine, one at negative of the frequency of the cosine. And if I just start writing that out, the, and the DC term becomes a direct delta, this cosine is a pair of direct deltas, and this cosine is a pair of direct deltas. And so I'm left with another impulse train in the Fourier domain. So if I have an impulse train in the time domain, I have an impulse train in the Fourier domain. And the reason this is important is think about the impact of this. If I were to sample so the result of sampling in continuous time is the function f of t times the impulse train p of t. In the Fourier domain, it's a convolution of the two Fourier transforms, the signal that I'm sampling and the impulse train. And all the impulse train is a bunch of impulses. Whenever I convolve with the impulse, I simply shift the signal by the shift of the impulse. So what happens in sampling is I get a, I get replicas, I get the original spectrum of the signal I'm sampling, that comes through, and I get versions that are shifted left and right by the sampling rate, left and right by two times the sampling rate, shifted left and right by three times the sampling rate. So I get a periodic extension in the Fourier domain of the spectrum of the signal I'm sampling. And I guess I skipped part D. I skipped ahead a little bit. So the, the impulse train in the Fourier domain has a separation equal to the sampling rate. All right, so all of this, by convolution, all the shifts that occur in capital F of little f would be zero shift omega sub s sampling rate, two omega sub s, but also minus omega sub s, minus two omega sub s. This one's going to stay with us until the last week. This is the of the four problems on this on this test on this test. It was it was a test at one time. On this homework set, uh, this one's the most important. This one shows up all the way to the last week. All three are going to be pervasive through the semester. But I will keep coming back to this in lecture. This particular problem. It's, it's a pretty important one. Any questions on this problem three? Okay, so last problem in here, which is having to do with lab two, which due to the snow day on Friday will you know not start till next Monday, a week from today. And this is to generate a 
one-sided cosine, or sine actually in this case, a one-sided sinusoid using a difference equation. And it's pretty, as we talked about in lecture one slides, this is a very efficient way to do it, but you lose a little bit of quality on the sinusoid doing it this way versus, say, a function call to the C library, in this case, SIN. But the good news here is I can do this difference equation I can do in double 64-bit float, 32-bit float, 16-bit int, lots of different ways to implement this. Okay, so lots of parts, there are many parts of this problem. So again, the difference equation, I have the current input value. It depends on, uh, the current output value depends on the previous output value and the output value two samples ago and the input value one sample ago. Okay, so the first thing I ask you is convert this to a block diagram. And here's the final answer, but let's go ahead and figure out how to get there. What, when drawing a block diagram, what I like to do is start assuming that I've got the input x and I've got the output y. And then look at the difference equation. Sorry to get both up here, but the difference equation. So I need to generate previous output and output two samples ago. And I need the previous input sample. So I put a delay by one sample on the input. Again, this is a you know system point of view of one input, one output. Again, I have a delay by one to give me y of n minus one, and another delay to give me y of n minus two. Next step is to multiply by the appropriate values from the difference equation. So what do I multiply the previous output with, y of n minus 1? What's the multiplier? 2 cosine omega naught. And I have to sum up a bunch of products. So there's the first product. Y of, uh, y of n minus 2, I have to negate. Previous input, I multiply by sine of omega naught. And there's my final answer. So, it's, I mean, if you see the block diagram, it's not as meaningful as going through this step by step. But here you can convert any difference equation into a block diagram. And if you're given the block diagram, you should be able to go back to the difference equation. Why do I care about a block diagram? Because everybody uses it as a way to visualize things. So to put the two answers together, everybody uses it, a lot of people use it maybe, to visualize things. So it's a visual representation, but it, because it's a graphical syntax, this can be embedded in a hierarchy of graphs. So this might be, in a higher level graph, one block. You double click on that block, and here is the underlying block diagram for that block. So it allows hierarchical design, modular design, to handle larger systems of thousands of blocks. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, so like, is there going to be like a circuit element that causes that particular delay where the v to the negative 1 is? Right, so the implementation of this in discrete time, all this delay block is, is it it has one word of memory, and it remembers the previous input. Initially, it has some value, which we'll talk about what that is. So I have three delay elements. All it is is a register, and it's a word. So on your processor, it's, well, more generally, it's whatever the word size is of x. So if you're doing this in 32-bit int, it's 32 bits. 32-bit float, it's 32 bits. Would you have, like, a periodic interrupt? That changes that value every second. No, it just, so, so if you were to actually run this, so this is how you compute the output given the input. Then what you do with it is how, now how do I get it off the chip? This is now, do I interrupt? Do I pull a transmit register? Which way do I do it? Do I do it one sample at a time, or do I do a block of samples? Right. But, it, but at least I need to figure, so in the code, this is three memory locations. 
that I have to, every time I run this filter, I have to read what's there to, to, to compute this multiplication, and then I have to update what's in there based on the current input value. So I have to do two things. I read and write for every output sample I want to generate for the, for the system. For every Y event I want to generate. I have to read this and then write and then update. Read that, update, read that, update. Now we're going to manage this with the circular buffer that's coming later. And we'll manage this with a certain, now here this, I don't really need a circular buffer, it's just one, yeah. one element. But more generally, this will be managed by a circular buffer on the input side. There'll be another circular buffer managing the, the, the previous output values here on the output side. Initial conditions, a couple ways. First of all, what are they? And then what value should they be? So initial conditions, we can get our hands on those by starting the system at the initial point in time. Now for us, it's generally going to be n equals 0. And we can always change it if we want to, but through the whole class will be n equals 0 as our starting point. So the first output value um, is going to depend on the current input value, possibly, which is x of 0, and possibly initial conditions. So let's look at the happen. So y of 0 depends on previous output value. That's an initial condition. Output two samples ago, and the input one sample ago. So those are my three initial conditions. So it's unlike differential equations in that derivatives would, would or even y0 would be my initial conditions. Here it's not. It's values of input and output prior to n equals 0. Now, if we keep running this, once we get to y of 1, the only initial condition that shows up is y of minus 1. And you could go to y of 2, and there are no more initial conditions showing up. So I have three of them. And I can also see it from the block diagram. Each delay block has an initial value in it. So I can get my hands on three initial values. Okay, so in this problem, I, I say a couple things about this system that you're implementing as a difference equation. I tell you it's linear, has a system property of linearity, system property of time invariance, and it has a system property, well, you can infer causality, but I think I mentioned it explicitly. So causality means the system, if I'm given a causal input, I'll get a causal output. Okay. Would that answer suffice? Yes, causality would suffice in this case because I specifically say that I want to look at the impulse response of this system. Right? And the impulse response is when the input signal is what? For the impulse response. Right, what does that look like? It's an impulse. What does that look like in discrete time? At the origin? Well, it's not as bad as a spike has a very specific value at the origin. One. Yeah, it has a 1. So for the impulse response, we let the input be the discrete time impulse, which has 1 at 0 and 0 elsewhere in amplitude. Go ahead. Um, something that was confusing me about this problem, does that mean that we know what x of n is for all n? Does that mean we know that? In this particular case, um, so the two things, one is yes, because we know, we know that this is the signal we want to input. And the response to this impulse is a, sin, is a sinusoid. In particular, it's a sine in this case, S-I-N-E. Yeah. Separate from that, my system has buried inside of it three initial conditions. So if I turn the, I'm really going to observe the system starting when n equals 0. So it's like saying that we have this system. It has some initial conditions. But here's another fact on top of that. If we were to put a delta, it would give us a sine. Correct. That's right. And from this, you can now infer, well, what's the initial, what is x of n minus, x of minus 1? Well, it's 0. Yes. Because this is a signal that we want to use. Okay. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, x of 0 is 1, because our input might not necessarily be a That's right. For this specific input, we know some things. Right? If I tell you that the input is causal, output is causal, which, I, which is, and it also tells you some more things. But more generally, I've, I've got a system with three initial conditions and I got to find the values, and I can find the values based on system properties. So for the case, so either I can impose causality on my on my system, which is my difference implemented by the difference equation. In that case, 
y of minus 1, y of minus 2, and x of minus 1 is 0. Linearity also gives me the same conclusion, which we'll show later when I review signals and systems next, actually starting uh, Wednesday, next lecture, and continuing next week. I can also get the same conclusion by time invariance. So any of those three properties gives you the same answer, and that's not too unreasonable for an implementation. You know, when I write C code, I like to initialize my variables to something, and zero is a pretty good, good guess for that. And it turns out this is what we want to use for these system properties. And last, I'll let you read this, is the uh, find the, trans the transfer function, invert that to get the impulse response, and lastly, plot. I do want to make one comment before you leave, which is in the middle plot, which is sine of pi n, MATLAB didn't give you all zeros. Not MATLAB's fault. Okay, this is what happens when you get negative, when you get numbers really close to zero. So these are 10 to the minus 15 uh -huh. values. This was is what it, I got. Was it necessary to plot it as a stem plot, or is it already plotted in? It's like, I would have preferred stem plot for discrete time. For a discrete time. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So, so from now on, use stem. In the future, whenever we have a discrete time, use stem. All right. Thank you very much. See you on Wednesday.